is the role of religious universities like BYU? How should they resemble or differ from secular universities? And has their role evolved over the past few decades, or will it? BYU must never become an educational factory. It, it's not, a university is more than a dispensary of knowledge or a storehouse of knowledge. It's about the formation of students. It's about helping students and those who come and participate in it become something and not just know something. We're speaking today with John Tanner, former academic vice president of BYU and most recently president of BYU Hawaii. John has devoted decades to the subject of education, and in 2017, he published a book titled Learning in the Light, a collection of his speeches given at BYU. We'll ask him about what surprises him about how BYU has changed over the years and what challenges he envisions for it in the years to come. We'll also speak to him about the educational ideals of BYU and what it would mean to realize them more fully. I'm Matthew Wickman, founding director of the BYU Humanities Center and the host of this podcast, and now our conversation with John Tanner. John Tanner, it's a pleasure to have you um, as our guest on the podcast today. Thank you very much for taking the time. Well, I'm delighted to be with you again, Matt. It's great. It's nice to see you. You've been, you've been out of the country, out of the state. Uh, you were the boss who hired me as the English department chair. It's been a while, though. <laughs> so. It was a great decision, wasn't it? And I'm <laughs> happy, happy, just delighted to see how you're flourishing here and doing things with this center. That's great. Thank you. BYU's been very good to me. In fact, maybe we'll start somewhere in there. Now, your experience at BYU is extensive. Uh, you've been a professor of English here, an administrator, including the department chair of English and uh, the academic vice president, so the number two administrator at the university. Um, then you were the president of BYU Hawaii. I want to ask you about religious education, uh, maybe generally, or maybe if you want to take it to BYU specific, feel free. Um, religion in the public sphere is a topic of controversy. And religious universities, I think there's kind of a, an imagined tension on the part of many between the imperatives of the religion on the one hand, the faith on the one hand, and education kind of open, free-flowing, open inquiry on the other hand. Um, as you've thought about the role um, of religious universities in higher education, um, what do you see as the most important function of such universities? I guess it's a two-part question. What do you see the most important function of religious universities? And has your opinion on that changed over the last couple decades uh, during your time as an administrator at these universities? Well, I've had a chance to think about that, um, as, you, as you said, both in this context and in a broader context. And most of my focus has been on what BYU can do as a religious university for the church and, and the flagship university for the church. But the broader question is an important one. Uh, religious universities actually are an, kind of an endangered uh, species right now. They're, many of them are on the margins financially. And so uh, they're struggling and we're losing independent colleges and universities, including a lot of religious universities at this particular moment in time. So the value they have is I think a very significant one. They increase the intellectual diversity and the uh, of the, of the broad educational system. They're actually the place where universities began. They, 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 uh, the, the Pope said in his, one, one of his messages, it's, it begins ex cordia, which means out of the heart of the church, the university has been born. So historically they've, they've come out of re uh, religious settings and including a lot of our secular universities like Harvard and other ones, or Princeton and others like that. But what they do, I think uniquely is they provide an alternative alternative uh, intellectual traditions in which to examine ideas. I think that's important, but I also think it's important that they have continued to embrace the role of seeing education as a formative process and not just an informative process about in a narrowly information transfer. It's about the development of, of, of human beings and other universities embrace that, but religious universities tend to embrace that with, full hearts. And I think that's really an important part of what it means to be a religious university and college. That's a great point, John, um, about the, I, I love that distinction, the formative versus the informative, the, how these things are, they're different. You know, one of the things that strikes me about the humanities as the director of a humanities center, I'm interested in the humanities. And uh, one of the challenges seems to me that the humanities have 
uh, is, as, especially as they interact uh, with the publics that they supposedly serve, is it's difficult to agree on what the human even is. <laughs> there are very yeah. different ideas in the public sphere. And it seems to me that in, in religious settings, you're able to explore certain kinds of questions about what the human is in ways that um, are built on the basis of a kind of a local consensus that allows for a deeper kind of um, reflection between or deeper correspondence between the research and teaching missions at a university or between what the university does and what the public, the community of religion does. That's a great point. Um, I'm curious, as you, when, when did you get to BYU originally as a professor of English? What year was that? Uh, in the early 80s. Uh, I, I graduated from uh, Berkeley. I embraced both BYU and Berkeley, which I yeah. think is the... Uh, <laughs> talk to you about my, my schizophrenia or the broadness of my soul. But um, <laughs> I, uh, I came, I went to Florida State for a couple of years and then came here in 1984. 84. Okay. So, so, no, excuse me, 19, yeah, in 1984. 84. All right. Um, as you, uh, so you've been at BYU, you know, off and on, um, because you've had a couple stints where you did other things, uh, either at BYU Hawaii or in your admission president in Brazil. Um, as you reflect on BYU as it enters the third decade of the 21st century, I'm curious about what would have surprised your younger self about where the university is today. Well, the university's undergone uh, tremendous changes in especially in our research uh, productivity and in our, scholar, our scholarly uh, expectations and uh, accomplishments. So I, I'm sure I would have been surprised to see our teaching loads. Uh, <laughs> I, I think that uh, that's, that's one of the concerns I also have that can we sustain it financially? It's, it's uh, costly. Um, and it has some other implications that are, I, I, I can, I'm concerned about, but I, I think it's been a, it's a joy to see how well the university is doing in in its combining research and teaching and and um, m having a place in the world that way. So that would have surprised me. I, I, I remember even as as an administrator when I first came in as an associate academic vice president, there was a lot of discussion over whether we should do research at the university, what that what that role was, and how that relates to our teaching mission. And uh, we, we've, uh, uh, our, the people that I studied with that were in the department when I came who were retiring would have had uh, assignments to teach four, sometimes even five composition classes a semester. Uh, it's, a, it's a different university from the, what it was, um, especially I'm thinking of the 30s, 40s before I came, but even in the 60s when I was a student here in the late 60s. Well, it was during this early 70s, 69s when I was a freshman. Anyway, so it's changed remarkably that way. I hope that what doesn't change is um, and never changes is that deep commitment to the gospel and to students. Right. Students have to be central. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Let me take a couple parts of what you just said that are really important. I mean, as faculty at the university, uh, I'm appreciative of the university's research mission, um, at the resources the university provides to pursue uh, sort of open and free inquiry and scholarship. This has been, I think, a, it has a, 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 a positive impact on faculty and I think students, though I, I do understand there's a real uh, balance that's to be struck between teaching, you know, and research. And research is expensive and increasingly expensive, right? Um, do you, as you, as you think now about your time as a professor in the English department, as the chair of the department, as the uh, vice president of the university, as the president of a whole different university, BYU-Hawaii, more on that in a minute, do you like the idea, or do you think the idea of a research mission at BYU Provo is sustainable? I sure hope so. I think it's important for there to be a university where, where scholarship is, is valued, celebrated. I, I like the word scholarship a little bit better than research or discovery. Mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that it's fundamental to what a university is. So I'm a little dubious of, of, of models that don't emphasize that faculty and students alike are learners. And the only, the only questions I have are, are cost and time and focus. 
Uh, it's not the, the principle of doing, of, of doing research and discovery. It seems to me that in some ways, the univer uh, a university should be different from say a high school in that teachers there are primarily consumers of textbooks and consumers of information. Whereas at a university, both students and faculty should be about discovery and should be players and engaged in the larger conversations that animate our disciplines. And we ought to be, we ought to see ourselves as participants in that and not just as consumers or observers of that. So I think that universities in, by definition really need to, need to celebrate that. And if they can't do that in, in terms of support financially, there should still be a celebration of any kind of discoveries or learning that we're, that we're engaged in as stu students or faculty. Okay, good. Yeah. It reminds me of an anecdote, a, a story of just my own. When I was uh, way back 20 years ago when I was in the job market and you were the chair when I was hired. So thank you very much, John, for <laughs> vesting some faith in me. Um, I, I, I flew out to a university I won't name, um, but one of the things they had me do was meet with the, one of the head librarians uh, over the subject matter of literature and humanities. And, and he took me through the library and was complaining a little bit about the library they had. Um, he didn't think it was quite up to par. And he said, he asked the question, can you have a top research university without a top research library? And this was a very fine university. It was a top tier university. And I won't ask the, the library question, but I, I, it does raise the question, can you have a full church educational system without some kind of research mission. Is that possible to have? It's, it's, it's a rephrasing of the last question, but if you have any further thoughts on that, I'd love to have your... Yeah, your... well, I, I was sort of the... In, in the President's Council, the Council of Presidents of all the universities, I was a, a, with Kevin an advocate in, from the, for the very reasons I just, I just articulated, that universities have to value research. And I hope that at least at BYU, we have a continue to have a strong uh, presence, uh, a commitment to scholarship and to discovery. I think one of the reasons we, one of the ways we've been able to do that is we've tied that to our teaching. The, the mentored learning idea came out when I was an academic vice president as part of our way of trying to figure out how to, how to in practice, join those two things together, teaching and, and, and research or scholarship. It works better in the sciences where there's a, more of a tradition of collaborative learning but uh, I mean, I published an article with a student of mine, undergraduate student of mine, trying to do that kind of thing. But but even when you're not formally, it's it's hard to paint a painting together. You know, co co paint a painting as you can co author an article or co write a poem. It's in just some disciplines are 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 less give uh, amenable to that. But even where you you don't co author things together, if there's a sense that you approach your students as co-participants in the discovery process. Right. And that mentality and that posture towards students can inform um, all the disciplines. And I think, I think that's important for us to keep a focus on our students learning and not just on our own beta building. I, that's the, one of the dangers of, 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 of scholarship. Um, it can become kind of a self-absorbed sort of thing. That's an excellent point. I, and I've, I've heard actually lots of colleagues across many universities talk about this, um, about kind of the tensions they feel between those two, those two parts of their, of their job, the teaching and the, and the, and the scholarship and how they really can um, create a kind of an absorption. Uh, actually, each one can become absorbing and, and the balance is difficult to strike. Do you think that there is, so you mentioned the sciences as being more amenable to collaborative research, faculty and student, because you have labs and, you know, the whole process relies on kind of a collaboration. You go into the arts, into the humanities, it's a bit more difficult. As you say, it's hard to co-paint a painting. <laughs> it's very true. Um, do you think that, though, there is um, a difference that a religious university makes about the kind of scholarship one undertakes? Should there be a difference or should the work one does at, say, BYU be the same that one would do any place else? Uh, that's a, a really good question, Matt. It has a lot of different parts to it, but I, I would want to affirm really quickly that I think our, our university, our scholarship should pass the, the, the standards in the, in the disciplines. Now, sometimes those can get a little skewed, and, uh, and maybe in the humanities, we struggle with kind of political influences uh, and so forth. 
but I have a re great respect for the disciplines and the ultimately disciplining themselves too. There's a kind of community of people who who we should we should uh, engage with, and that's that's important. That's the whole idea of peer review. Uh, that there are, these are peers, and they should be able to. We should be able to put our work forward and, and into that community. Um, but I, so I do think we should have standards, and those standards should imp, uh, involve things outside of our religious uh, communities. But they ought to, they ought to, it ought to be clear in our work, some way or another. We ought to, we ought to. The, the work should be part of a consecrated life. And so it should be, you know, I, I love the, the tradition in, in the Jesuit, Admin Majorum Glorium Dei, that you, you do your work for the greater glory of God. It used to be that in a Jesuit school, some students would write ADMG on the top of their papers, uh, uh, Ad Majorum Glorium Dei, or whatever they announced. It. Just like Bach, I mean, yeah, Bach did that, uh, to God's glory alone, Sola Glorium Dei. He'd write that in the bottom of his compositions. In some ways, we ought to be writing that on the bottom of our, uh, on the works that we present, is this something that is helping me uh, build the kingdom in some way? That's why I chose to come to BYU uh, from Florida. I felt like in some ways my life, my career would be, if whatever, whatever honors came to me would somehow re reflect on the church or I would be more of a part of building the kingdom. And and I, there, there's there's need for faculty outside the. I, I better be not go on. But there's need for faculty in the larger academy. Need for Latter Day Saint faculty who are faithful to be examples out there, so that the students don't see that the only way to be faithful is in the institute. It's also consecrated geologists who are, happen to be in your university too. But having said that, for me, I felt like my mission, I could fulfill it more easily here, where I could speak out of a the fullness of my heart and my beliefs, and I could do it in the building of Latter-day Saints who would build the kingdom. You've really modeled that, John, um, both excellence in your field, um, but also uh, the way you've consecrated your, 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 your intellect, not just your scholarship or your teaching, but your intellect to the university and to the students who are here. And, it's, and the faculty who are here, it's made a tremendous difference. I wonder if we can talk about a couple of um, passages from your book, uh, Learning in the Light. Can I just interrupt you before yeah. you do that? I, and that yeah. consecrating your intellect it reminds me of something that has become really important to me. It, it is that Jesus adds to the great commandments when he says how we are to love God. It is Jesus that adds the term with our minds. Oh. <laughs> and I am, I, I mean, that's a really important point that the Lord says we, we are to love God and love our neighbors with our minds. And, and I see our roles as in, the, in the university as ways of doing that, of, of, of loving the Lord and loving our brothers and sisters and studying their arts and the humanities and their languages with our minds as well as with all other aspects of our being. So on that idea of consecrating your intellect, it really goes back to the to Jesus's teaching about the, of the great commandments. I, I really, I really appreciate that, John. That's a, that's a great insight. Thank you for sharing. Um, this is again, this is the book, uh, Learning in the Light. Uh, selected talks at BYU. Um, these are your talks at BYU, and there are several. I was quite impressed actually with just the sheer bulk of the book. Um, a couple of passages though. I just get your thoughts on these. Here's one. Uh, from an essay titled, Not a Mind Without a Soul, uh, you write that, I suspect that when heaven looks upon your lives, goodness matters more than greatness. And I'm curious what you think that means for a student in the classroom uh, or for faculty, that goodness matters more than greatness. Well, that that's actually speaks to a fundamental value of mine. I, I'll, I'll tell a quick story. My, my son-in-law, who became my son-in-law, was dating my daughter. We were at an honors banquet, and he's a brilliant young man. He just finished his uh, inter work at Harvard and is a, an oncologist and leading. He's got a study coming out in the New England Journal this, this month. And, you know, he's a bright guy. Yeah. But what mattered to me in a son-in-law and what matters to me in, in my own life and in the lives of human beings are, are our discipleship matters. It matters more than just our, our, our vetas. Uh, and I think it has a tremendous, a lot to do with how I see what, what our role is in the university, what I think the Lord cares about in the university most, that he cares about whether we're 
our, ourselves, we're developing deeper discipleship in our lives. When I gave my, my swan song, my farewell talk um, to the university uh, when my, and it was announced that I was being released, I, I used the metaphor of a journey of uh, Stevenson, a, a Scottish. Indeed. A home where, you know, his his <laughs> epitaph that he wrote, that home from the sea. But I said, in that journey, when we're going to that heavenly haven, um, for me, the task of discipleship is the larger task than the task of being a scholar, a teacher, or my, my resume. I, I've become increasingly uncomfortable with people introducing me with resume, you know, because... Because frankly, those things are fine. But what really matters to me in my day-to-day -day living is, am I, am I being a good father, husband? Am I, am I a decent human being? Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter whether you're the president of the United States or whether you're a, a peon. What matters is, I mean, being a decent human being who cares about people and is kind and good and decent finally matters the most. Now, that has a lot to do with the kind of institution I think we need to build here. We need to build faculty who are, who are great and students who are wonderfully the best they can be, but are meek and humble and, teach and, and are seeking with their lives to, to, to live those two great commandments, to love God and to love their neighbor and to realize that all people are their neighbor. That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, it's a lofty aspiration, a meaningful one, I, um, and one I think that I'll, I see this in a lot of my colleagues. They are better teachers, better scholars because of that commitment. I, I've, I've seen that actually manifest on the campus many, many times over and over again, uh, and I see it in students um, in the way that they that they learn, grow, develop. Um, Another, here's another uh, passage from your book. There's a different essay, a different talk you gave. It's called Rejoice With Them But Do Rejoice. And you write um, that to praise aright, that is to praise what is truly praiseworthy, is to confirm the values that bind us together in healthy communities. What does, what does praising aright look like in a university setting or maybe a classroom setting? I'm curious what that, what form that, well, that you've seen it probably taken. comes... It probably relates more to our fields and the humanities than I mean, that's my natural frame of reference here. But um, I, I think it's like loving a right. What do we what do we love and admire? What do we praise? What do we find beautiful or uh, you know, things that help us be better human beings? And I, I don't think that means just the beautiful. For me, the, the importance of confronting evil is important. It, 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 that's a very important thing that we have to also do at universities. But we do that in terms of it being evil as well. You know, we don't praise the Holocaust. Right. We don't praise being um, being uh, cruel to other human beings, right. whether they're whether they're like us or not like us. The, the gospel invites us to to think about what we praise, but. Part of that, I was thinking about what culture is and how important culture is. The kinds of things that, uh, that as a community, we, we decide uh, are praiseworthy. I'm thinking of Joseph Smith and the kinds of things we agree upon. Do we laugh at, at, do we laugh at, the, at, at the, the poor or the feeble or the outsider? Or do we... Do we, does, the, does the community constitute itself so that those sorts of things are are seen as unpraiseworthy? So I, I actually think it's, for me, that re, the, the larger essay was that we need to learn to rejoice for others. And, yeah. and that, is, that also speaks to our challenges in the academy, that sometimes... It's a place of envy and competition. Exactly. You make the point. It's an excellent point. There's a, there's a famous uh, passage, a famous, well-known, oft-cited passage of Scripture in the Book of Mormon, uh, where a group of, of, of disciples, uh, would-be disciples, are uh, pledging to live as a Christian community, and they, they pledge to mourn with those that mourn. And uh, you make the point that it's sometimes easier for academics to mourn with those who mourn than to rejoice with those who rejoice. <laughs> yeah. Can you elaborate on that point a little bit? Well, I, I mentioned that that was a personal uh, principle I grew up with. I'm from a family of 13 children, mm. and um, it's pretty easy to have sibling rivalries. 
is, is, I said, it, it, I said, I've often said that if you get a dozen apples, you're short. And you already said, set in motion competition. You know, my father used to say, we need to learn to rejoice in the successes of others. So when we'd open Christmas presents, meager as they might be, we'd take time and would celebrate in any gift that the other person was getting. I, I think that's a something that suggests a healthy community where we learn to celebrate for each other. And um, I, part of this, that talk was re, was inspired by reading Gilead. Uh, mm. uh, it's, Marilyn Robinson. By Marilyn Robinson. She says in that book that uh, one of the characters says that the, he's a preacher, he's a minister. He says one of the hardest principles for him to, to live is the Tenth Commandment of covetousness. He, he's single and he, he, he wants children and he envies and and. I think envy and covetousness and, and all that are, are, are in, in an academy where we celebrate accomplishments, sometimes those are um, professional temptations we have to, we have to avoid. Again, I, 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 love the, I love people that have generous souls and I want to develop that in me, a soul that says, my colleague, I, I celebrate my colleague's uh, accomplishments as much as more than I would my own. Yeah, that's a, it's. I've I've taken note um, the past several years. Uh, you know, I I feel very fortunate at BYU to work with extraordinary um, colleagues uh, in various disciplines, and of course, the students at BYU are are exquisite, uh, right? Um, I have though noticed uh, over the past few years that I feel a special joy when a colleague who I regard as not only great at something but deeply good yeah. is recognized uh, for some measure of her work or his work. It, it, it's, it's very um, I find it I find it especially meaningful. Um, well, what you're doing with the center promotes that kind of collaboration and celebration and exchange of ideas. It's what we came to the university expecting. We, we, we came thinking this would be a university where we talk to each other and often we're separated in our yeah. cubicles and in our, in our own little, in our own little um, worlds. So I love what you're doing, Matt, and to try to, to try to have more deeper civil conversations where we talk about uh, our ideas. That, that should be what the humanities is all about and what a university is all about. I appreciate this program that. that you have. I mean, this is the kind of thing yeah. that one looks would look for in a university, but rare, too too uh, infrequently it's uh, is found. I appreciate that, John, very much. Um, one of the, the 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 passages of scripture you come to again and again in this book, Learning in the Light, and your speeches at BYU was Doctrine and Covenant section eighty eight, which is a great. And you make the point that it kind of it's a it's a it's a passage that connects the idea of the university to the idea of the temple, a place of learning and a place of worship. And you make a, there's a, one of your essays is titled Gospel Ground for the Humanities. And a uh, passage here I want to read to you, just get your thoughts on it. And it kind of transitions to another question I'll ask you in a moment. Here's the passage. You say, the yoking of opposites is typical of the restoration of the gospel. The restored gospel encourages Latter-day Saint scholars to embrace dichotomies that tend elsewhere to be broken apart, such as study and faith, reason and revelation, head and heart, body and spirit, heaven and earth, human and divine, and so forth. Uh, section 88 encourages a holistic approach to learning, one that engages all the human faculties. It's a lovely uh, thought it's a, a, an, an ideal. Is that one that you've seen accomplished at the university as frequently as you uh, might wish or might have thought? Uh, no, I don't think it is as frequently accomplished. It still exists out there for me in my own life as, as one of those ideals that I, I aspire to and and delight in when I see it. Um, but it is it is that sense of being a whole person that that um, the, the, a university like this can that can afford us where we can we can bring our all that we know and all that we feel to to the project of learning and discovery that I, really is, inspires me. I, I find some some um, some challenges on both sides of that. Sometimes you feel like people people may use that ex the excuse that we we've, we've learned that in Revelation as a reason not to 
ask any other questions where people kind of dismiss the revelation of mind body whatever it is so i like i i find it a, a something that inspires me to try to continue to to do my best by challenging uh, myself my ideas uh, I don't know if that's the right, the best answer to the question. But no, I, I like the answer. If you were talking today to a young faculty member, you know, I remember that being in that boat myself, you're pulled in so many directions. You're trying to get your feet under you and get accustomed to what it means to be a professional, not just a student. Uh, you feel pressures from your field, pressures from the local demands of the department in which you work. If you were giving advice to a young professor about how to begin thinking about cultivating that virtue, making it a habit, is there something that would be a, a kind of a, a, a particular piece of advice that you think would be especially helpful? Well, I don't know if this will answer that question exactly as you've asked it, but you might, in one of the essays, the first essay of that a book, was the first talk I gave as an academic vice president. And it really grew out of an experience I had in my own in my own uh, career and trajectory of of feeling all those pressures to to get tenure and to get advanced and all of that, and feeling like something was being sapped from me that I was beginning to do things for the wrong reason. You know, you were you were I was publishing to get tenure, or I was doing teaching to worry about uh, evaluations and things. And I felt something dying inside of me. Uh, it wasn't the reason I came to the academy. And that's where I argued in that essay. And then I tried to give this as a, 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 to the whole faculty that we need to base our lives on love. And, and, and that, that's where I talked about professionalism and amateurism and not to yeah, let right. the amateur, the amateur die, the am am amateur coming from the word to love the passion and uh, excitement and joy. I, and I, for me, I identified three loves that, that would, I call it my professional pyramid. One was a love of, of the, of the subject matter because I really did. I do like, and I, you, you can get, you can, you can, you can lose that if you're not, you're not careful in kind of the drudgery of just becoming professional. Yeah. And the other one was the love of the students and, and, and then the third one, of course, is the love of the Lord, the, the sense that you're doing something for, for larger purposes, even the larger purposes than your own career, and you're trying to build the kingdom. Anyway, that, that would be one way I'd think about that, giving that advice. I'd say, you've got to be practical. You've got to, you've got to manage your time and prioritize and all the things that you, you can get in any, any sense, you know, the advice that anybody else would give you, I could. I could give you that. So what I do is I'd say really quickly, here's the advice. Make sure you write every day. Make sure you da, 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 da. But this is what I'd say if you really want me to talk from my heart. I'd say, keep, here's this professional pyramid. Keep, keep doing the right, the, the things for the right reasons. That's and great. That is for love. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I did, that's 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 uh, your own version of the John Wooden pyramid of success. You know? yeah, but, but 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 important wisdom I think for those who really want to realize um, all of what a church university like BYU uh, can afford. Um, on that subject, you know you've you've seen so many different sides of church education. You've been a professor, you know, faculty member in the English department. You've been a chair of that department. You've been a vice president of the university. Then you were president of a different university, BYU Hawaii. Did your experience at BYU Hawaii uh, give you a new perspective onto the role of either religious universities generally or church education specifically? Yeah, it did in both cases. I'll probably talk more about church education and answer that question. Okay. In terms of in religious education, uh, it's incredible. It is absolutely incredible the support that we have from our church for education. Yeah. It's just, uh, it's unprecedented. The sort of financial support that we've supported in time and intention, attention, they want to know about every hire. They, I've seen the budgets now, the multi-millions of dollars that are committed to education in this church. It's just, it's astonishing. And then you, I, I associate with my colleague presidents in other universities, and it is, it is just amazing. So there is a deep commitment from the church, and I've got to see it up close and personal monthly meetings with the prophet and the, and the brethren and the board about that. But, but as far as uh, Hawaii, it really did. It wasn't, it was, I knew about um, 
the church internationally. I've been a mission president and I've seen some of that. But this gave me a chance up close and personal and it gave me a chance in my own career to reach out to students that I that were struggling and I loved, you know, and we don't get, we teach the creme de la creme here. And here we get to teach students who are poor and and from, uh, from other countries. They're, I, I call them academic orphans. Sometimes they were real orphans. It, Hadika is a student from Cambodia whose mother abandoned him twice. He grew up on a hmm. on the streets and in the he was he was in the trash when his when his grandmother found him. This is a young man whose story just just melts your heart. Well, I was so delighted to be able to work with that kind of diversity, both ethnic diversity and economic diversity and international diversity, and and affirm a mission of the. Uh, and a mission that I think is the mission of the Lord that, to love all people. And we're able to embrace that. And it was, um, it was thrilling to, to work with those, those kids at BYU Hawaii that came from very different backgrounds. It must've been, it's an extremely international university. Is it not BYU Hawaii? I mean, it's not massive in terms of number of students. It's not like it's a 30,000 big BYU Provo, but it's very diverse, right? Yeah, it's very diverse. And I, I remember when I was writing the diversity statement, we're helping do that here. I, I thought, well, at least the system has BYU Hawaii. <laughs> and that was before, I, well before I went there and I was glad for it. It's, it's, um, um, it is, it is uh, the most internationally diverse per capita or maybe one of the most, we don't have great yeah. data of any university in the country. Wow. And so it's, it's amazing. You know, more than 70 countries are represented in this little school of 3,000. When I got there, I felt like we had, in, 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 in uh, Hawaiian, you call them Howleys. That means people yeah. like me. And I thought there were just a lot more Howleys people there to surf than I wanted. And so I made a huge <laughs> effort to try to re reverse it. We actually reversed the numbers so that the, the proportion is we have fewer mainlanders. And the mainlanders we had, we sought for people that, that had... Uh, part of the Polynesian diaspora or the refugees from South, South, uh, Southeast Asia uh, who are in the ma mainland, we really, we really incre deliberately increased our diversity because I felt like that was our mission. It was it, yeah. wonderful to embrace. That seems that's, that's an important initiative. I, I I I didn't know it needed to be done. Uh, if it did, I'm glad that you did. Uh, I, I've always associated BYU Hawaii with primarily uh, a non Howley like me uh, population. Mm -hmm. um, we have about five minutes left, John. I've got a couple of questions I want to ask you. If you could begin uh, your career over, I'm curious how you'd counsel your younger self. But conversely, whether your younger self would have something to teach this more experienced version of yourself. Well, if you've read some of my essays, you'll know that I, I don't think that's possible. I think we live, yeah. we live with faith in an unfolding future. We don't know, so uh, we we want to know the beginning from the end. I, I I often say we want a Moses experience where we can kind of see the beginning of the end. We get an Abraham experience where we're walking <laughs> through the desert. And we have to have one step at a time. It's it's Hebrews chapter eleven where yeah. you have to walk by faith. But as far as that goes, I guess with my my older self, I'd tell my younger self, it's going to work out. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I lived with a fair amount of anxiety when I was in Berkeley. Um, I, I got a letter accepting me to Berkeley, and it said, you can come, but there are no jobs. And there really were not any jobs. And uh, of the people that got a PhD with me that my year, I think two or three of us got a tenure track job. Yeah. So there was a lot of anxiety, uh, and, a lot, and so naturally I wrote about my dissertation was on anxiety in, the, in Paradise. That's right. Uh, anxiety in Eden was their book anxiety title, Anxiety right? in Eden. Yep. And so, and so I guess I'd tell my, my later self it's, it's going to work out and just, just in, try to enjoy the journey with a walk with faith. I tried to walk with faith. My older self, my younger self, I'd say don't lose the enthusiasm. And yeah. Probably try to teach as an administrator. I tried to do things as, as an administrator that would keep me connected to the life of the university and not just to budgets and, and you know, the kinds of things that drove me crazy, memos. And I, that's why I wrote that little, those essays that became notes from an amateur. And I wrote essays like, just to keep me somehow in touch writing and thinking about things in a broader sense. 
So I would I would say uh, do that, but try to try to teach and 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 try to do a little more scholarship uh, as an administrator. I've I've just come back and I'm starting to do try to finish some papers that I'd started ten years ago, and I, I they're actually pretty good. I don't know why I didn't publish them. <laughs> But there's a larger project, and I'm I'm grateful to to be able to have a little time to maybe, maybe do this project on the phenomenology of sacred space and paradise lost. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, it sounds great, Sean. I, I hope I hope you can finish that up. That sounds provocative. I'd I'd happily read that. Um, last, I, I, thinking again about church educational system, and and you know, it has to be attuned to matters of budget and numbers of students and, and all these things. There's a, there's a very, there's a, there's a science to it, but it's also, there's also an art uh, to running a good system this way and balancing the various needs and um, possibilities. And What do you regard as the biggest promise of BYU looking forward, and what do you maybe envision as the university's greatest challenge uh, in, the, in, the, in the years ahead of us? Well, begin with the challenge. One of the challenges is the, the fraction of the students in the church that we can teach. It's right. the limitations and the growth is going to be greater. And so we have experiments and things that we're doing like Pathway and other, other kinds of things. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that we we will we have the chance to we'll have the chance to innovate. But I'm grateful for the way that we've held on to a kind of a traditional university model here, and I, it, it's going to be a continual challenge to continue to do that well. Um, Spencer Kimball said, um, and he was quoting Joseph David o. McKay that BYU must never become an educational factory. It, it's not a university is more than a dispensary of knowledge or a storehouse of knowledge. It's about the formation of students. It's about helping students and those who come who participate in it become something and not just know something. And I think to do that, we need to continue to find ways to enrich the human interactions that we have. I, I don't know what the implications of COVID are going to be and all the, the technology that we're using right now, which I'm so grateful for. But, but I believe we, we have a theology that is a, has the richest theology of the body that I know. We, we have an embodied presence with each other that we need to, we need to figure out how, what that means in the way we communicate and teach too. And so, because for me, the greatest thing that universities do is, is they put people together in communities and then let them learn together. I, I don't know how much of that community can become virtual, but I hope that there will still be these rich human interactions that we can nurture of faith. That another challenge will be continuing to, to have a kind of sweetness and um, meekness and holiness about the place when we become, as you become better and you become more elite. How do you, how do you maintain that, that humility and meekness and, and goodness as, I, as I've talked about earlier? Well, John, I, um, I have such immense respect for you and uh, deep gratitude uh, for all that you've given to the university and uh, to me uh, personally. Um, thank you for taking the time uh, to talk with us uh, today. It's a real, uh, both a privilege and a true pleasure uh, to talk with you. And uh, I wish you uh, all great uh, success uh, this year and the things that you're teaching and doing and writing. Um, and I look forward to seeing you uh, around the hallways and over the, uh, you know, Zoom, the zoom sickles that we create, these <laughs> Zoom rooms. Uh, so thank you very much, John. It's great to see you. Thank you for the invitation, Matt. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening to this episode of the BYU Humanity Center podcast. Think clearly, act well appreciate life. This podcast is sponsored by the Humanities Center and the College of Humanities at Brigham Young University and is produced and edited by Brooke Brown and Sam Jacob. The music for this podcast is composed by Ethan Wickman and is performed by the Soli Chamber Orchestra and Nicholas Phillips on Albany Records. I'm Matthew Wickman, founding director of the BYU Humanities Center and host of this podcast. If you're interested in other episodes of this podcast or want to know more about the BYU Humanities Center, 
check out our website at humanitycenter.byu.edu. Thanks again for listening. Thank you.